in the beginning god in the beginning god genesis chapter 1 verse 1 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth so this morning we talk about false gods in a way this will be a complementary or a supplementary uh, to that uh, preaching so today this evening we will talk about the one true god the one true god the one true god whom we serve in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth genesis is a book of beginnings it is foundational to christianity it it has foundational truths about the origin of man the origin of sin and also the promise of the gospel but for this evening i would like to propose that the written revelation itself commands with the reality with the verity of god in the beginning god 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 was there from the from the very uh, beginning i would like to focus then on this evening on god our lord as we expound and explain to you the very first verse in the bible here on the opening chapter of the bible we are introduced to the one true god the true god of heavens and the earth in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth we can uh, focus our uh, meditation uh, by looking at the three character or the three attributes of our lord present in this very verse we can look at number 1 god's eternality god's eternality he is an eternal god secondly we can look at his aseity or his autonomy or his independence god is self sufficient god he doesn't need us he doesn't need anything he is by very person of his being self sufficient independent god and then lastly we will look at his third attribute his sovereignty his power his might Amen. so we can look at this um chapter uh, on this verse and we can focus our attention then uh, on our lord look at uh, let's jump in now to uh, our first point our first point is god's eternality god's eternality we can see in verse 1 in the beginning in the beginning there was a time when there when time was not yet time and history is a created entity before time has been created there was god amen our theologian wrote this beautifully for us and i'm quoting him in the beginning there was no heaven where his glory is now particularly manifested there was no earth to engage his attention there were no angels to him his praises no universe to upheld by the word of his power there was nothing no one but god and that not for a day not for a year or an age but from everlasting during a past eternity God was alone by himself self-contained self-sufficient self-satisfied in need of nothing that is our lord Amen. so in the opening chapter of the bible we are introduced immediately to the glory and the majesty of the eternal god god is eternal there is something that scripture there is something uh, that's And this is something that the scripture has time and time again declared to us. Psalm 90 verse 2 for example, Psalm 90 verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Amen. Psalm 93 verse 2 says thy throne, Psalm 93 verse 2, thy throne is established of old. thou art from ever lasting remember the name of our lord is yahweh yahweh the god who is forever i am he is forever present forever there and forever here there is no past for him there is no concept of present to him there is no future to him 
all the aspect of time flows in one stream for him because he is an eternal God. Uh, a, a medieval theologian said it this way, Augustine uh, said it this way, you have made all times and are before all times. You have made all times, but you are before all times. I would like to divide our meditation on, now on two themes under this heading, which really the two sides of the coin in respect to God's eternality or God's eternity. Number one, we can notice that God has no beginning. God has no beginning. Verse one, look at this again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The truth is just profound. As the book of creations and the beginnings and the genesis of everything opens up for us, we are introduced to the one who was always there. There he is in existence, in eternity, all glorious, all powerful and full of majesty. I just love how the Bible shows us the existence of God here. At the opening salvo of our scripture, the Bible did not defend the existence of God, nor argue for the proofs of His existence, but fully declare and proclaim unashamedly the existence of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Before atheists would exist, God was there. Before the proud and arrogant enemies of God was created and born, God was there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is there. There is a God who exists and we proclaim them to you. God has no beginning at all. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that... Um, Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary, there is no searching of, of his understanding. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. He is the everlasting God. He has no beginning. Daniel chapter 7, verse 22, he was also referred to as the ancient of days. As the ancient of days, meaning the one who was always there before time eternity. So God has no beginning. God has no beginning. I think this is a question that most of us would uh, hear, especially with the, with the kids. Uh, some of, of you would actually say and ask, who made God? Who made God? And that's a proper question. Kids sometimes question that, uh, ask, uh, ask those questions. And maybe some of us here, uh, older folks, would ask those questions as well. Well, the answer to that is this. No one, no one created God. He is the creator and not the created. He is our creator. The world has taken this in two ways. Atheists would say the great argument for God was that there had to be a creation, a beginning. But my objection was simple. This is one of the, I'm quoting one of the atheists here. If God was the beginning, who begun God? That is their, that is their arguments against God. Well, well, I cannot imagine, I cannot fathom in my mind that there is someone who is the created, who has created everything, yet he is not created at all. So there seems to be, according to them, uh, 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 they, they reject in a way and they doubt the existence of God. But for us, our response really is not to doubt this, not to go against this, but our response as Christian is this, to worship our God, and to worship Him. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I remember when I was a young boy, I remember when I was young, and I have those same questions too. Where does God come from? Who created him? What is he doing in eternity, really? What is he doing there by himself? What struck me is this. Here I was, I was living in the slums in a third world country, 
contemplating the origin of God and realizing really that it is beyond me, beyond my comprehension, beyond my mind can ever grasp. And you know what? And my heart was filled with wonder to that God. A couple of decades now, since then, the question still pops up, still comes again and again and again, and you hear them. And I go back to that scene, and my heart's now even filled with great adoration to our Lord. When you think about the God, about the beginning of everything, and before the everything, before everything else, God was there all glorious, all holy, full of majesty and power. And I think our heart should bow down and worship to that God who is eternally there. Amen. Dear congregation, these are truths in the Bible. This, there are truths in the Bible that is not meant, uh, not meant for us uh, to study microscopically. I love to study. I love to dig deeper into to whatever is, um, uh, what is ever before me. But there are times that we have to sit down and ponder the wonderful and glorious God whom we worship to enjoy the meditations of this truth and marvel at the great goodness and the greatness and the immensity of the God whom we worship. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. God has no beginning. God has no beginning. But also notice here, we can notice, God has no end as well. He has no end at all. Verse 1, again, look at this. Verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If he has no beginning, then he has no end too. There will be, one who will, there will be no one who will be able to kill God and cause him to cease to exist in a way. There was no point in the history of humanity that a person was accused to kill and murder God. No. Even our Lord, when he was crucified on the cross, truly died. He truly died in his humanity. But never, never ever in his divinity. If there is one moment in the history of this world that God ceased to exist, that God died, then it will be a devastating and it will be a catastrophic event that no one will ever imagine. Yet God will never die. God will never die. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou will endure forever, one scripture would say, forever, forever, for eternity. Look at this, he promised to be with us in eternity as well, correct? There's no point for him to promise eternity with us if he, in one day, with one point, will cease to exist. No, dear brothers, no, dear sisters, I proclaim to you, God who is eternal, who will forever be there until, until eternity. He has no beginning. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Should it not give comfort to us, dear brothers, that our Lord will never die? Should it, give, should it comfort you that our Lord, your Lord, the one you serve, will never, ever, ever, say that, ever die? No, there will never come to a point that he will cease to exist. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is eternal. The people whom, whom we trust may leave us. The government that provides safety to us, safety net for our community may collapse. But never, never in one moment that the Lord will abandon us, will forsake us, will, will abandon and be absent in our life. God is eternal from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. He is there forever. Revelation chapter 4 verse 9. We are given with a glimpse of the one who sits on the throne. Revelation chapter 4 verse 9. And everyone was worshiping the one who lives forever and ever. Sometimes I, 
I have to put some applications for you, like on the practical side. We will, we will have some practical application as we, pro, pro, um, as we progress through the preaching. But uh, my application for you is this. Maybe, maybe this is a time for you to worship God. And an application for your heart to adore our Lord, to give glory to the one eternal God whom you serve. Brothers, sisters, dear congregation, he is an eternal God. He is an eternal God. Secondly, we can notice, number two, God's aseity, or his independence, or his autonomy, or his autonomy. Look at this. In the beginning, who was there? God was there. In the beginning, God. Not only we can see the eternality of God, but we can see God's independence. The word I use here is what, nor uh, what the normal theologians would use as well, they call the aseity, uh, this is the quality of, 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 or the state of being self-derived or self-originated or the absolute self-sufficiency, independence and or autonomy of our Lord. He is self-sufficient. He is by himself self-originated. We have a term called self-made man. Self-made man, and you know this. People who have become successful and rich through their own efforts, through their own will. Well, we have, I propose to you, we have much better than that. We have the self-sufficient God. He does not need anyone. He is by himself all glorious and powerful. He does not need any air to breathe or food to be alive or water to, uh, to drink. No. One theologian said it, said it this way. God is absolutely independent and self-sufficient. This is a truth that is proposed to us again and again in the scripture. Look at, for example, Acts 17, verses 24 to 25. Acts 17, verses 24 to 25. God made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with man's, hand, man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath all things. My emphasis here, as though he needed anything. As though he needed anything. No. Job, uh, jo Job chapter 41, verse 11. Job chapter 41, verse 11 says, Who had prevented me that I should repay him? Whosoever is under, what, whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Everything in the Lord, everything in this world is for the Lord. Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12 uh, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and fullness thereof. The truth proposed here is this. God does not need anything. God does not need anyone. In creation... There's one question here, and some of you kids may ask that, this question as well. Uh, in creation, why did God create man? Why did God create man? Some, some, some folks would actually say, well, because he is sad. Well, we, the, Lord, the Lord may be maybe sad, you know, and lonely during that time. No, no. It is not because he is sad in, in time eternity. And as, as if to justify the longing for fellowship and companion, he created humanity. No, not at all. Not at all. He does not need anyone. He does not need anything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here is the wonder to it, though. Here's the wonder to it. He allowed us to participate in this joy. I don't, I can't imagine, I don't understand really why the Lord has to create us at all. But he allowed us to participate in that, in that joyful companion with the Trinity. He allowed us to participate in joy. He allowed us to, to be with him and for us to commune with him. In fact, he allowed us to even to worship him and to ascribe him all the glory. And although he is altogether glorious, hopefully you see the irony here. So then why did God uh, create you? It's not because he is sad. Uh, one of the catechism would say it this way. What is the chief end of man? What is the chief end of man? Why is man created? 
Well, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. It's not the other way around. It will always be for us to enjoy God, although in some mysterious way, He enjoyed our presence too. So, in creation, God did not create man because He is Son. Secondly, we, uh, another observation here. He does not need us at all. He doesn't need us at all. I got breaking news for you, for everyone. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need you. He, did, he doesn't need us to worship him at That's all. Right. He doesn't need me. He doesn't need everyone. Luke, number, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 40. Luke chapter 19, verse 40. The stones would immediately cry out and worship our Lord. Psalm 19, verse 1. If you don't want to worship God, the whole heavens declare the glory of God anyway. Amen. Sometimes we may think how important we are in this kingdom of our Lord. As if God needs us to proclaim the gospel as if, as if he can do it by himself. No, no, not at all. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need us at all. But again, there is a sweet mystery here. He chose to use us anyway. He chose to participate and, and use us. He chose to use you and your skills and, and your talents, the, the, the talents that came from him anyway. That's right. And he asked us to do something for him. For his kingdom. For his kingdom. Don't you realize what a privilege it is to serve the Lord? What a privilege it is to serve the Lord. It's not a duty. It's not a duty. It's not a chore. It's not a burden. But an awesome, a great privilege to be called by God and to serve him. He does not need us at all. Yet he allowed us to be used in this kingdom. Uh, of work and, uh, uh, and was part of some uh, great million dollar work projects in, in Adelaide. And I know, I know some of you are there too, you know, working in, in, uh, of national importance of, of that affects the public. And, and somehow you can be proud and look back and say, hey, yeah, I was part of that project. Yeah, uh, yeah look at that building. Yeah, I, I, look at that school. Look, look at that super school. I, I, I was actually part of that pro management team there, okay? It will always be a proud moment for us. But you know, in kingdom's cause, it's just different. It's just different. It's always humbling in a way. I mean, uh, why would the Lord use us? Well, I mean, us. I mean, you. You. There are more better people than us. Why would the Lord use us? He could have used other more talented people, more skillful people. But no, he used you and me. Just to be personal with you, although I love preaching, I, I hate it in a way as well, especially in, it, in this context, for example. I'm not a good talker. I'm not a good, uh, I don't have a good English, but, but I don't, I, I just, I'm just so insecure with, with, with my words. I just really have to really write everything so that I will, tell, I will have to write and say exactly what I need to say to you. Like even impromptu, I can't do it. But, but it's a privilege, really, just to stand before you and, I, and, and a privilege. And I can't say no to our Lord. It is a privilege beyond all we can imagine to be, to be alongside the king and in this kingdom's cause. So I urge you, I urge you to serve the Lord more. I urge you to, to those who has not been serving yet, hear, hear the call now. Listen to the call of God. It is, remember, a privilege given to you to serve with our Lord. It is a great, great privilege. And I hope and pray that, we will pray that you, when, until the very, very last strength that you have in this life, that you may serve the Lord as he wills for those who are serving serve the Lord with all your heart serve the Lord with everything because he is worthy of everything in the beginning God is there and that doesn't need you at all yet he chose you yet he chose us what a great privilege that is in the beginning God in eternity he doesn't need us yes he chose to do so notice here as well it's he is in a Trinitarian fellowship 
Trinitarian fellowship. Notice here as well the truth of the Trinity. We we'll just gloss over it. Uh, but the truth of the Trinity is founded here in the opening chapter of the Bible. In the beginning, God. God here is the triune God. God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. John 17, verse 5. <coughs> John 17, verse 5. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had before thee, before the world was. This is our Lord. Verse 24. Father, uh, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold thy glory, which thou hast given me. For thou loves me before the foundation of our Lord. Here we can see the second person of the Trinity. Our Lord before, uh, was existing before the foundation of the world. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The earth was without form and void. And the darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So here we can see the truth of the Holy Spirit. Trinity is in communion with one another. All glorious, all existing, eternal Trinity. So we can see the Trinitarian fellowship. We can notice as well here, just a few passing comments here. God is independent. God is independent. Maybe a few applications for us then. You know, we should be always dependent upon God. Always be dependent upon God. We can rely on our Lord. We can depend upon Him. Uh, so some... Some would criticize that uh, the word independent Baptist church is not on our church, in our, on our, uh, on our uh, Facebook and all those stuff. But I will say, yeah, we put it there already. We are a church for you, independent Baptist church. But I would probably propose, no, no. And this pastor has said a number of times, we should be called church for you, God-dependent Baptist church. Because we should always, we should always not depend on ourselves, but we should always rely upon our Lord. We can depend upon God. And personally to you too, we should always rely on our Lord. We should depend on Him on anything. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. So we should be God-dependent. Right. But also, just another application for us here, we should find our satisfaction in God alone. We should find our satisfaction in God alone. There is nothing in this world that can fill up our desires. Only God alone can satisfy your life. Husbands and wives, you cannot never, never satisfy one another. A singles, for those who are single, having a partner in the future cannot satisfy you. Those who are addicted to things, whether substance or your favorite sin, those will never satisfy you at all. Amen. And sometimes you would say, oh, I might go to church and you know, maybe the church may be able to fulfill all of my longing and satisfaction. Breaking news again for you, the church will not be able to, uh, to provide all the satisfaction that you need. No, not at all. But no, let me direct you to the one who will be able to do so. God alone. God alone. One theologian said it this way, another medieval theologian here. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator who made known, who made known through Jesus Christ. There is a God-shaped vacuum in our heart. As you try to fill it in with many things in this world, it will always come in empty-handed, always lacking. And try as you may to gather all the, all, all, all the material things in this world. Try as you may to gather all the accolades in this world. You may be the top-tier uh, IT professional, always with my illustration, top-tier IT professional. But no, no, it will never, never satisfy you until you rest in our Lord. Only our satisfaction is in God. You have made us for yourself, Augustine said again. And our heart is restless until it rests in you. I wonder, I wonder what you're longing for. Let me tell you, let me direct you to the one who will fulfill all your desires. Our Lord himself. He is eternal. He is by himself self-sufficient. Acts 17 verse 28. In him we live and move and have 
our being. So we can notice here God's eternality, his independence, his aseity or autonomy. And then lastly now, as we end, God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. Verse 1 here, in the beginning, <coughs> look at this, God created the heavens and the earth. My focus is now on the created, the heavens and the earth. We can see on, on the opening chapter of the Bible, the ultimate power of our Lord. His ultimate power. He is an almighty God. Now, look at this. We can notice two things here. He created the world by his might, first. But also, secondly, he created <coughs> the world with gracious and good intentions. He created the world by his might. He created the world by his might. What is the manner? Look at, let's look at the manner of God's creation. He created it through his own power, out of nothing. Here on this verse, we are reminded how God easily created the world by his own word, by his own power, by his own divine will. Everything uh, began to exist in an instant by the command of his word, by his sovereign will. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of, were not made of things which do appear. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of our Lord. Psalm 36 verse 6 and also verse 9. Psalm 36 verse 6 and verse 9. By the word of the Lord where the heavens were made and all of the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, verse 9, and it was done and he commanded and it stood fast. So here we can see that God alone can do such a marvelous work. God alone can do such a marvelous work. That is the power of our Lord. We proclaim to you the absolute, ultimate sovereignty of God over all things. He is a powerful God. There is nothing too difficult uh, for Him. Brothers, sisters, there, if there is one atom, one small particle that is in the universe that is outside God's control, then God invalidates himself to be God. One rogue particle that is outside of God's sovereignty. If there is such a thing, then the Lord is out, not the Lord anymore. Then God is not God anymore because of that small thing. But I proclaim to you, everything is under the command of our Lord. And we ascribe full sovereignty to God. And don't you realize how comforting this word is? To us, to you, to Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for thee. You know, as we go through many trials and sufferings in our life, we can always rely on an almighty God. Because if he's not almighty, we cannot depend upon him at all but he is almighty Amen. he is almighty i don't know what's hap what's going through your life maybe you are going through some some particular challenges uh, i want i would like to remind you of the power of our lord he can do all things recently what really really um minister to me is that as w when my kids uh sing their hymns the kids hymns it's just simplicity in those truths my God is so big. He's strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His. The rivers are His. The stars are His handiworks too. My God is so big. He's strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. I wonder, maybe that... Maybe you should start singing that on a, on a Monday morning. Or maybe when you are all by yourself now after this service, and you, all, the, all the sufferings and trials that you go through, it has popped back again, again. Remind yourself, my God is so big. He's strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God can us do. There's one more. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hands. Brothers, 
sisters, your problem is in this world, and this world is in God's hand. That's right. You can trust on Him. We can rely on Him. He's got the whole world in His hand. He created the world by His might, and lastly now, He created the world with gracious and good intentions. We look at the manner. How did God create the world? By His own power, out of nothing. But look at this. Why? Why does He have to create us at all? We can further sur surmise the, from this passage the intention of our Lord. The intention is to show God's goodness and grace. He is an all good God. He's a good God. He's not obliged to create you. He's not obliged to create us at all. He's not obliged to show his love to us. Yet sovereignly, he created and showed his riches of love to us. Just read briefly here the treasure box of the Christian. The treasure box of the Christian. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 onwards. Just, just a glimpse really. I won't be able to read the whole thing. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, with, blessed us with all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He had chosen us in Him, when? Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him. Verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of glory of His grace, wherein He had made us accepted in the Beloved, in Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. Brothers, sisters, the Lord created us to show His love and goodness to us. I wonder if you are not yet in Christ. I wonder by today, if you, you, know, like you keep on attending the church, or maybe it's your first time in this church, and say, look, the Lord has been harsh to me. No, no, the Lord has been good to you. And in fact, if you are not in Christ, He's offering and extending His offer of salvation to you now. Call upon Him. Rest on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Put your satisfaction not in this world, but on Christ and in Christ alone. In Him we have redemption uh, through His blood. I appeal to you. I plead before you. If you are not yet in Christ, the Lord is a good Lord. The Lord is a gracious Lord. Come to Him. Present yourself to Him. Invite Him in your heart. It's all grace, dear congregation. All grace. Why did the Lord have to create us? He doesn't need to, but He chose to anyway. Some uh, question on, on the internet. Why did the Lord create us? The answer is this. Uh, for one of the gotquestions.org. It, it says this way, and I kind of phrase it this way. Recognizing the complete sovereignty and holiness of God, we are amazed that He would take man and crown him with glory and honor. Psalm 8. Uh, Psalm chapter 8 verse 5 and that he would condescend to call us as well as friends John 15 verse 14 to 15 why did God create us God created us for his pleasure so that we his creation would have the pleasure of knowing him come to the Lord and there is fullness of joy in him joy that is overflowing come to our Lord I think it will be an appropriate ap application for us now as we to exhort you as God's creature. Let God have the primacy and ultimate priority in your life. What is it that consumes your interest? What is it really? And I know for myself, for example, I do have lots of interest that really consumes my time. What is your priority? You may have your own priority. You may have your uh, 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 interest. May I urge you then, may God fully occupy all our hearts and our minds and strength. I cannot fathom why the Lord has created us at all, yet He did so. Not only He created us, but He sustains us. He, provided for, he provided for us. He saved us. He sanctifies us and He will glorify us. I don't know about you, but He has given all. He has given all. May we give all to our Lord as well. Eric Little, the evangelist and the uh, gold, uh, gold medalist in the Olympics, uh, said it this way. Eric Little said it this way. Many of us are missing something in life because we are after the second best. I put before you what I have found to be the best. 
one who is worthy of all our devotion, Jesus Christ. I wonder, I wonder if, if many of us will actually settle for the second best. That's not best at all. That's not good enough. Let's go for the very best and make God the ultimate, has the ultimate primacy and priority in our life. One hymn said it this way, When I survey the wondrous cross, where the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so, demi so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hopefully we have seen the eternality of God. We have seen the self-sufficiency of God, the autonomy and independence of God. He doesn't need us at all. But also we can see the sovereignty of our God. Let us worship our Lord as my, our ultimate application. And let, let us be amazed at the God whom we serve. He's not a false God. He's the one true God who was there in the beginning. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, uh, for this wonderful time. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that we can rest on you on this Lord's Day. And then we can meditate upon the, this great truth of Christianity, the great truth about you, O oh Lord. In the beginning, you are there in time eternity, all glorious, all powerful. May we bow down our, our hearts and our knees to you and worship you, O oh God. You deserve all glory and all praise, O oh Lord. And as we go on our separate ways as we tackle our daily life and daily struggles and daily trials, O oh Lord, that you have allotted to us, that you have by your sovereign hands given to us. We pray, Lord, that you will be with us and may our hearts rely on you and may we remind our souls that you got the whole world in, in your hand, that you are so big, so strong and mighty. There's nothing that you cannot do, O oh God. We praise you. We pray to you. We praise to you. We give you praise, O oh God. And we worship you in Christ's name.